Electricity is known almost everywhere in the world. It lights lights and turns motors in every country on the face of the earth. Motors that drive pumps to supply water to grow food. But electricity is not universally available in the quantities needed to do the work that needs to be done. Work that in many places still must be done by other means. To produce electricity requires energy. This energy may be extracted from falling water, striking the blades of a turbine. This turbine is the modern version of the ancient water wheel. Water rushing downward spins the turbines that are coupled to the electric generators located above them. These generators actually make the electricity. Because water power isn't available in most places where electricity is needed, steam is more often used to drive the turbine. This steam is produced by heating water. The heat energy necessary to produce steam is supplied by burning fuel, such as oil, gas, or coal. Some countries have an abundance of this heat energy, vast resources of coal, oil, and natural gas. And therefore, with the associated scientific skills, electricity can be made in such quantities that it directly affects almost everything that people do. It lights homes. It preserves food. And helps in the preparation and the cooking of meals. Electricity powers whole industries. Industries that make furniture, spin fabrics, and build houses. Electricity even provides transportation. But in many areas of the world, fuel is scarce, and so electric power is unavailable or very expensive. Furthermore, the entire world will face a serious power problem within the next 50 years, unless a new source is made available. The apparently tremendous fuel resources of today 
will last only a limited number of years. When the gas, the oil, and the coal are gone, they must be replaced. But replaced with what? Atomic power is today's answer for tomorrow's problem. Here are some atomic energy fuels. Plutonium and uranium. But before they can be burned, the fuel is squeezed between two pieces of metal into a thin sandwich, sealed at the edges and assembled into fuel elements. When exactly the right amount of fuel is assembled in exactly the correct arrangement, A reaction starts within the nucleus of the uranium atom. This chain reaction takes place in the core of a nuclear reactor. One of the products of this chain reaction is heat energy. And so the atomic furnace gets hot. This heat energy can be used to generate steam, just as the heat from burning conventional fuels is used. The energy from the nucleus of the atom is the energy we need for tomorrow's power. In most reactors, the core can't be seen because it's housed in a very complex installation like this. Here, the nuclear reaction is contained, controlled, and the heat energy extracted so that it can be used. This then is a report on how the United States makes electricity from atomic energy. It is an account of the work performed by government laboratories and the industries of America in producing atomic power. In 1942, at the University of Chicago, the first atomic reactor was built. The guiding genius behind the project was Italian-born Enrico Fermi. The initial operation of this reactor on December 2nd, 1942, was one of the most important milestones in the history of human progress. This event demonstrated that it was possible to achieve and control a nuclear chain reaction. This experiment began the long but rapid march toward the production of usable atomic power. At the Argonne National Laboratory near Chicago in 1946, the United States government established this major research center for the design and development of nuclear reactors. It was here at Argonne that plans for the first reactor that produced electric power were conceived. Although the design was necessarily elaborate and complicated, the basic idea was simple. Instead of an assembly of flat bars, the fuel elements were in the form of rods. Since all nuclear reactors generate heat, the problem was to devise a method of transferring this heat generated within the radioactive core to the boiler where water is converted into steam. What was needed is known as a heat transfer system. One of the first systems devised employed a mixture of liquid metals, sodium and potassium, circulating through and around the core. This makes the liquid very hot, about 662 degrees Fahrenheit. And so as the liquid emerges from the core, it carries a lot of heat with it. But it also becomes radioactive. The liquid sodium and potassium become radioactive by contact with the nuclear radiation within the core. The problem now is to get the heat to the water, but not the radioactivity. So, a heat exchanger is used. The hot radioactive liquid metal circulates through a closed loop. Surrounding this loop is a container housing another closed loop. Through the second loop, also circulates a mixture of liquid metals. The heat is transferred from one liquid to another, but not 
the radioactivity. From here, the second liquid circulates through the boiler, where it gives up its heat energy to the water, changing it to steam. As each of these liquids gives up its heat, it circulates back to absorb more. And so the cycle continues. To maintain the circulation, pumps are added to the system. And so we have steam, the same sort of steam made with conventional fuels. And it can be used to generate electricity in the same way. However, this steam is generated by atomic energy. This reactor represented years of research, plus the planning of many scientists and engineers. It was the first in the world to generate electricity from atomic energy. While the design was conceived at Argonne, it was actually built in the state of Idaho on the route of the old Oregon Trail. This is the Snake River Desert where American pioneers made their way to the Pacific Coast over 150 years ago. Today, it is the site of the United States government's reactor testing station. Here on December 20th, 1951, the first operational test began. With all preliminary checks completed, the orders were given to start the reactor. As the controls were set, the nuclear reaction within the core increased and the temperature rose. Below, in the steam boiler room, the circulating liquid metal began to create steam. The pressure increased. The throttle valve was opened, and slowly, the turbine started to drive the electric generator. When the proper voltage was reached, the nuclear power was sent into the distribution lines. Electricity from atomic power was a reality. But bigger and more efficient reactors and heat transfer systems still had to be designed. If cities and factories were to be supplied with atomic power. To accomplish this, the United States planned far into the future. At the United Nations on December 8, 1953, President Eisenhower, speaking before the United Nations General Assembly, called for a worldwide Atoms for Peace program. In 1954, the United States Congress and the Atomic Energy Commission enlarged atomic power development into a formal program. And so the designers went to work. Their ultimate goal was to make electricity as cheaply as it can be made with coal, oil, or gas. But this was difficult because in the United States, these conventional fuels are still comparatively cheap. Here's the situation faced by the nuclear reactor designers. There are a number of different atomic fuels, the various forms of uranium and plutonium, many different kinds of heat transfer systems, liquid metals, water, heavy water, gases, and organic liquids, and many different types of construction materials. The problem is to get the right combinations. There are many possibilities, but certain combinations will produce power more efficiently. You can't try them all, because it takes about three years and a lot of resources to build a power reactor. And so the most likely types were selected for a program that extended across the country. Northwest of Los Angeles, California, in the Santa Susana Mountains, a reactor was designed and constructed using enriched uranium fuel and liquid sodium for heat transfer. 
a system known as the sodium reactor experiment. This reactor supplies some of the electricity used by the homes and factories in Southern California. Basically, this heat transfer system is similar to the one put into operation in Idaho six years earlier. It uses the same liquid metal heat transfer idea. However, the liquid metals are different. So is the arrangement of fuel in the core. In the summer of 1954, from Denver, Colorado, President Eisenhower actuated an electronic signal that was transmitted 1,000 miles to a small community on the Ohio River in the state of Pennsylvania. Once an almost forgotten spot on the river, the village of Shippingport became a center of interest for visitors from the four corners of the earth, for this was to be the site of the Shippingport Atomic Power Station. This project required years of intensive effort by the most advanced scientific and engineering skills. The resources of hundreds of American industries were necessary to create the components. This reactor was designed to generate more than 60,000 kilowatts of electric power, enough to supply 165,000 American homes. Scientists from all over the world seeking new sources of electrical power found its fundamentally simple design of great interest. This type is known as a pressurized water reactor because pure water under great pressure is used to transfer the heat from the core to the boiler. Notice, this system does not use an intermediate heat exchanger. The shipping port reactor core is encased in a stainless and forged steel container called a pressure vessel. Thirty-three feet high, with walls eight and one half inches thick. The whole pressure vessel is surrounded by steel and concrete. overhead crane can lift the pressure vessel dome and pull out the core for replenishing the 15 tons of fuel. This must be done about once every three years. This is the master control room. The core temperatures are indicated and recorded automatically. Here are the controls for the steam turbine. And these operate the electric generator, delivering electric power to the distribution lines at the required voltage and flow. The electricity made here will probably never be as cheap as other electricity in the United States. But shipping port is providing valuable experience, useful in building future nuclear power plants. Because more is known about this system, it can be built today with the assurance of successful operation. Operation that can be economical in countries where conventional fuels are scarce. In the state of Virginia, the pressurized water idea is also used in an extremely compact nuclear power plant. Every component of which can be transported and put into operation at remote locations. In the state of Tennessee, at the United States government's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, another type of nuclear reactor was developed. It is known as the homogeneous reactor experiment. This system is quite different from other reactors, although it still performs the basic function of getting useful heat energy out of the nuclear reaction. This carefully designed sphere sustains the nuclear reaction. Notice there are no fuel elements fixed in a core, as in the more conventional reactors. 
In this system, the fuel is dissolved in the heat transfer liquid. That's why it's called a homogeneous system. The fuel is enriched uranium in liquid form, dissolved in ordinary water. This mixture both generates the heat and carries it. The nuclear reaction can take place only in this sphere. From here it enters a pipe which is too small to permit the reaction to continue. The heated fluid then gives up its heat to the boiler, generating steam. This pump circulates the mixture. Besides the basic simplicity of the homogeneous reactor, there is another advantage. It doesn't need to be shut down for refueling. More fuel can be pumped in whenever it's needed. This system must operate at a tremendous pressure and the mixture is extremely corrosive. To design this reactor, engineers had to overcome many new obstacles. New materials had to be found and pumps of an entirely new design had to be created. While the basic circuit is simple, in actual practice, it's complicated. For example, this homogeneous reactor requires 26 miles of pipe. In December 1956, the Argonne National Laboratory put another reactor in operation. The electricity it produced supplies electric power for the laboratory and buildings at Argonne. This is the control room of the experimental boiling water reactor. Here, the control rods are operated to maintain the nuclear reaction in the core. Basically, this reactor is the simplest of all power reactors. Here's why. The reactor and the steam boiler are combined in one unit. There are no heat exchangers. The reactor core is located inside the steam boiler. Or, in other words, the water boils into steam right in the reactor housing. From here, the steam goes directly to the turbine coupled to the generator. As nuclear power design advances, the systems get to look more and more simple. But of course, this simplicity embraces very many complex technical problems that require years of research, development, and more years of testing in actual operation. Valves adjust themselves. By means of closed circuit television, gauges and meters report exactly what is happening in the reactor itself, located in another part of the building. Remote television cameras like this one transmit the information visually to the control room. Control rods move to maintain the desired level of operation. This is where the steam drives the turbine that's coupled to the generator. Thus, there are five basic power reactor types developed in the United States, which will eventually be the most successful. Much more operating experience is required before this can be determined. But rather than waiting years for all the answers, American Free Enterprise decided to forge ahead. By 1958, there were 11 power reactors in operation or under construction in the United States.
Information on the design and construction of these nuclear reactors is available to people everywhere. For the United States realizes that new sources of power are vital to the welfare of all. By 1958, 14 nations had completed agreements with the United States to help them acquire the skills required to build and operate nuclear reactors. Under these agreements, countries can also request atomic fuel. 50,000 kilograms of uranium-235 have been made available by the United States for just this purpose. One pound of this 20% enriched fuel is equivalent to 500,000 pounds of coal. Fabricated into fuel elements, this uranium is available now to those who can use it. These resources, combined with the human resources of ingenuity and scientific skill, constitute the components of the new age of power. Power from the nucleus of the atom. <laughs>